TV from Studio A. My name is Taya Shanice and this is Season 8, Episode 1 of IDTV 2016. I'm Jeffrey Morant and together we'll be your personal tour guides for this 30-minute ride. Thank you for joining us here at City College of San Francisco. Hey Jeff, can you imagine playing video games for a web audience and getting paid for it? Heck yeah, money for nothing is always good. And you'll dig producer Mark Santos's report on Twitch. That sounds cool. You know, unlike video games, we have some very real issues here in the Bay. Producer Anna Solish and her team spoke to an organization helping homeless LGBTQ youth, and I think you'll find it stunning. Homelessness, oh man, very real. San Franciscans are certainly familiar. In 2016, we'll vote on some red hot items like housing and new supervisors. This will probably affect you. Thankfully, producer Carol Summers will help us parse the issues. What about the propaganda, the political propaganda? The national campaign has some very cray-cray things going on. Propaganda, yeah, there's a lot of that floating around. IDTV's Michelle Fraser came up with a story about propaganda, how to recognize it and not be manipulated. And by the way, oh my gosh, we have a special treat. Rapper S-Class is coming in today, and he's dropping an exclusive track about corruption in our city. Don't miss that at the end of the show, but up next, we ask you, ID Tribe, are you happy? Hey, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. Alrighty then. Well, let's kick this off and let's end it on a high note. Producer Matty Dosa reports on something everybody strives for, happiness. Scientists have been studying it. Books are written about it. Websites are devoted to it. The small Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan measures it. Happiness one of humanity's oldest pursuits. But what is it, and how do we achieve it? To get answers, we talked to Gail Danching, who teaches creative happiness at San Francisco State, and we interviewed people at City College and Golden Gate Park. I think happiness is to travel to a different world with the one you love. Some people for happiness, happiness is materialistic things, having a lot of cars, having a lot of money. But for some people, being happy just means to have just the simple things, just to have comfort, just to have health. So I think happiness can come in all forms. Well, my understanding of happiness is that it has to do with different states of positive states of being, such as some people might call it happiness or contentment or a sense of well-being or joy, or inner peace, or calm. And, and you can have that, you can find that in many different ways. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> All right, get the oh. off my boat. I'm sure we'll be seeing each other real soon. I'm sure. Good luck on that subway ride home to your miserable, ugly <laughs> wives. I'm going to have Heidi lick some caviar off my balls in the meantime. Hey, you guys want to take some lobsters for your ride home? <laughs> miserable pricks. I know you can't afford them. I know like a lot of people think, oh, if you have a lot of money, like that creates happiness and everything. Like I know a lot of people, they want a lot of money, they're like, oh, I'll be happy. But at the end of the day, like I know a lot of people who do have a lot of money, but then they don't have no like love or affection. So I think the main thing that like for happiness is like love and having someone there to like share all the materialistic things with you. And what's really interesting is that the research shows that having more material things you get, a, you get a boost for a while in your level of happiness, but after about six months or so, you go back to your original level or set point for happiness. I want to be happy, but I won't be happy till I make you So there's, happy. okay, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning. Having a meaningful life has to do with doing things for the greater good, whether it's in your family, people you're close to, the community, or the, the, the planet. Could be any of those things. Relationship doesn't just mean 
a one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship, right? It has to do with your social support network, friendship, or practicing gratitude. Not only does it lower depression, those kinds of practices, mm -hmm. but it has really positive health benefits. Yeah, like if you're not thankful for everything you have, and you're just gonna be a negative person in my opinion. And like, I know I, I wasn't always thankful back then. I'm like, oh my God, I want this, I want that. I just wanted a lot of materialistic things. But then I just realized like, that just made me into like having a negative attitude towards everything and I wasn't really happy with myself. I just wanted more. It's that self-compassion is be, being kind to yourself and understanding with yourself and tender with yourself rather than being harsh and critical about an area where you f have regret or you feel like you failed at something. I'm person personally really hard with myself and then I maybe uh, appreciate less um, things that's happening to me because I would never say oh good and like yeah sometimes but most of the time like you should do better like you didn't you didn't did good enough you have to work more. A lot of the research shows that if you increase your sense of well-being it, it decreases your um, blood pressure it increases your the production of oxytocin which is the hug hormone the love hormone that's the parasympathetic nervous system and that gives you a sense of well-being. Forget material things. According to the people we talk to, focusing on gratitude and friendship and compassion brings happiness. And the good thing is, that's something we can all do. So get ready to be happy. Good. We couldn't be happier. So, welcome. Hi, I'm Miyoko Sakatani, and welcome to In the Know. With me today is J. Scott Weaver, an attorney affiliated with the San Francisco Tenants Union. He has been a San Francisco tenant and housing activist for over 40 years, 30 of those years exclusively representing San Francisco Bay Area tenants. Scott is also co-author of the NOLO Press book, California Tenants' Rights 20th Edition, and which will be released on June 27, 2016. Glad to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, could you explain a little bit about the, what the inclusionary rate is, means and its negative impact? Well, the inclusionary rate is, is, has been one tool that's been used to try to produce low-income housing. Mm -hmm. uh, Valencia Street is a good example in, in the Mission District where they've built a, a great deal of market rate housing on the northern part of Valencia Street and it's kind of had a domino effect going down the uh, going down the street. When you build market rate housing, you actually create a demand for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, if you put a hundred people paying market rate rent or market rate purchase price on condominiums into a, into a project, that's actually going to, because those wealthier people have more disposable income, mm -hmm. that's going to create a, um, a need for other goods and services. And so the people providing them, the restaurants, the clothing stores, and so forth, they're going to want affordable housing. And they're going to need affordable housing, but we're not really providing enough affordable housing to fit the new people that, that, are, are, that, the, the, that the market rate housing is creating a demand for. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to, it's kind of like a Downton Abbey. Mm -hmm. So you have Downton Abbey, right? And you've got, you know, a, a very wealthy right. family. Right. I don't know, maybe there are 10 of them total that are living in this huge house. Right. And, uh, but look at all the servants they have. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like that right. same kind of concept that, you know, when you put 100 market rate developments in, in, a, in a location, you are actually creating a need for more people uh, to have housing. The other thing is, is that we've already overbuilt market rate units. Yes, absolutely. Every seven years, the city sets out a, what they call the housing element that they, that they provide to the uh, state, and it gets approved by the state. And uh, in the last housing element, the amount of uh, uh, affordable housing was supposed to be 60% of all housing built was to, supposed to be affordable and 40% market rate. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? In the last seven years, we had 200% market rate. So far, from the beginning of 2015 to the present, there has already either been built or in the pipeline 
enough market rate housing to satisfy our needs through 2022. Mm. One of the issues that came up recently is the Google buses. Oh, yes. Yeah, the, uh, the commuter shuttles. And so they stop at various parts of the city. And um, they, and they, they transport people who, who live in the city down to Sunnyvale or Mountain View and then back. So if you were working for Apple and wanted to live in the city, wouldn't you want to live next to a free shuttle to work? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what, what putting the shuttle stop, for instance, at 16th Emission does is it, it increases the demand in that particular area. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are, I think, 122 stops throughout the city. And the anti-eviction mapping project has done kind of like a plotted on that map to figure out, well, is there any correlation between Ellis Act and owner move-in evictions and where these shuttle stops are? Mm -hmm. You know, to nobody's surprise, there is a correlation. Yeah. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. I want to thank you, Scott, for joining us. And uh, I hope everyone will get out and vote on June 7th and November 8th. Let your voices be heard. And be sure to check out the Tenants Union website at sftu.org to keep up with the latest developments. I'm Miyoko Sakatani. Thanks for watching IDTV. We serve the LGBT youth and we make sure that they have all the resources that they need to become productive in society. A lot of them are homeless and a lot of them are coming from underprivileged society and so we really are trying to allow them to become leaders with internship opportunities and also provide them with housing opportunities and just really make sure that we're um, developing young leaders to really take the lead in the future and making sure that the world is a better place. that we serve are homeless for a variety of reasons. Some of the main ones are a lot of our youth are coming to San Francisco as a result of family rejection or because they're experiencing violence in their homes. So that's often leading folks to leave their homes um, in search of safety. I remember going through a lot of times and just living in my car, homeless. I didn't really have anyone to tell me it's going to be okay, no one really understood. The shelters in San Francisco are not um, safe spaces for trans and gender nonconforming youth. There's a lot of interpersonal violence that is happening in San Francisco, largely by the police. And so the same sort of conditions that a lot of the youth that we serve are hoping to flee are actually occurring here. And a lot of times are, are happening in more severe ways. I didn't have any like youth programs I was a, a part of. Something that ec like played an echo to my soul, it wasn't, I never found it until I found Lyric. There's also what's happening around gentrification and there's new communities who are unfamiliar with the culture of San Francisco and see people of color, they see people who use drugs as threats. And it's a lot of xenophobia that I think is is, is informing the people who have arrived. Of course, they're in conversation with the police. They're calling the police because they're afraid. There's really not a lot to be afraid of. I think, it, it, I think it's just, it has a lot to do with people just being really unfamiliar with the culture of San Francisco. I co-facilitated a group. Um, it's a sex worker advocacy group. Um, we're trying to launch for a Know Your Rights campaign basically um, geared for youth who are of the LGBT community who are homeless. There's, a, there's just a clashing of cultures. There's um, this major class divide that is just fueling violence against queer and trans people, people of color, sex workers, drug users, immigrants. So many communities are being impacted by criminalization right now. I've been on the streets for approximately three years and the biggest challenges I face is trying to survive day to day. They treat me like I'm subhuman, like I'm not even 
um, like I have the sign right here that says, yes, I do exist. It's very sad. But it's not going to change who I am or change how I go about living. I'm going to continue to be positive until there's no more breath in me. I want people to be open to learning because I read this quote and it's just, I live by it every day. When you listen wholeheartedly, you're at risk of transformation. And in order to listen, you have to open your heart. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on! What are you playing? Drum battle. I'm usually pretty good too. Drum battle. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Twitch? No, I haven't. Twitch is a live streaming service where people can showcase their talents, gaming related or not, to the world. All right. Where can I learn? Here, let's check it out. In 2016, there are many forms of entertainment. Instead of watching live scheduled television, streaming your content online has become more popular. A new site called Twitch was founded in June 2011 and has become the third highest streamed website. Twitch is social video for gamers. Streamers will live broadcast themselves playing video games to an audience that can interact with him or her via chat. In 2015, the monthly peak in broadcasters on Twitch is just over 2 million and 12,000 are partnered with Twitch. People broadcast themselves because it's a new way to show their love for games. 25-year-old Brian Thompson grew up a gamer and streams from his apartment daily. Uh, streaming uh, on Twitch, the thing I enjoy about it the most is, you know, interacting with the Twitch community and meeting other, like, gamers that are trying, like, that are actually serious about it, they want to compete, or other people that just want to, you know, show support, and you have, like, live discussions. The community is what makes up Twitch. Every community is different. Some are funny and friendly, some are vulgar and competitive. In my opinion, the gamer community is, like, one of the best communities to be a part of. Like, everybody is, like, really chill most of the time, like real, like real down to earth gamers, they don't have, like they're, if, if you're gonna play, if you wanna play, everybody's down, like nobody's gonna say, you know what, you can't, you can't, you can't. There is the competitive factor where, which I really wanna do competitive gaming and you know, go into tournaments, and that's the part of the community that I wanna be a part of the most. Big conventions like the PlayStation Experience, BlizzCon, and of course TwitchCon are broadcasted live on Twitch. Big game tournaments like ES Sports, ESL, EVO, and the International Five also get broadcasted. Twitch also introduced their creative page last year. Their creative page is made up of musicians and artists. You can see people painting, sculpting, and playing music. If I'm like done streaming video games after a while, I'll basically just like start producing because I try to produce um, every day. So, and I stream a lot. So right after I stream, I'll normally go into a music segment. And during that music segment, I'll either just start up a beat um, from scratch. So I'll normally just start with uh, either a vocal, um, some percussion or some type of uh, bass line or synth line. Um, and then I'll just start with one loop, build that loop up um, to about a minute, um, a minute whole, a minute loop. And then I'll just break down that minute to expand um, a whole like uh, three minutes. Like, I'm not really looking to be one of the biggest streamers. I just want to be like uh, an avid streamer in the community. But we're just out to have a lot of fun and just like, you know, learn the game and know the game as much as possible. Charities like the Children's Miracle Network, Doctors Without Borders, and St. Jude's raise money using Twitch as a platform. $17.4 million were raised for more than 55 different charities in 2015. The Twitch community is very special. It's what makes up Twitch. Live streaming content online has become more popular over the years. It will be interesting to see what the future holds for entertainment. to have a clear understanding of state and local issues and of the candidates vying for the highest seat in office.
the presidency of the United States. Are you an informed voter? Do you understand what each of the presidential candidates stands for? Do they share your ideals? Are you confident that the choice you are making is in your own best interest? Registered voters in San Francisco will cast their votes for the primary presidential election and on state and local ballot measures June 7, 2016. The United States presidential election will be on November 8, 2016. What is political propaganda? It is a timely and poignant question. Are we able to make distinctions between political messaging and propaganda? What is loaded language, pandering, scapegoating? What do we need to keep a lookout for in slogans, posters, speeches, and debates? Let's find out. Please welcome to IDTV Julie Edwards, a senior account executive at Storefront Political Media in San Francisco. Julie has over 10 years experience working in Washington, D.C. as a senior advisor for Senate campaigns for U.S. Senators Jeff Merkley, Patty Murray, and Elizabeth Warren. Welcome to IDTV, Julie. Thank you so much for having me. Let's start with the most important question. What is political propaganda? So I really think that that depends on how you define political propaganda. Um, a lot of people will say that any sort of political messaging is some form of propaganda, anything outside of just hard data. Um, and some people will say even hard data, you have to look at the source. But I think most people would make a distinction between political messaging, which is putting forward a strong argument, and propaganda, which tends to be divisive, scapegoating, pitting one group against each other, and very often false and inflammatory. Are there any key techniques with political messaging and propaganda? I think in the most typical sense is what you see is a politician or a political movement that singles out a group as the other and blames the other for all the problems. Um, this classic example of this, of course, is Nazi Germany and the way they singled out the Jewish population is the reason for all the problems in that country, which had horrific repercussions for our entire world. Obviously, millions of people lost their lives because of that. But you see it also in the present day as well, um, when in the current presidential campaign, when a candidate will say, this is the reason, or this group is the reason why we don't have jobs, or they're the cause of crime. That is false and inflammatory, and it's really divisive and bad for our country. Those are two awesome examples because we're definitely seeing a lot of scapegoating yeah. going on right now. And so for young voters, when we're watching the um, candidates go on for debates, are there any red flags that we can look out for? I think the key one is consider the source. Yes. If this person has a track record of divisive language, of false attacks, then anything they sh say should be treated with skepticism. Second, consider what they're trying to accomplish. Are they singling out a group? Are they trying to divide people? Are they making simplistic arguments for complicated problems? If they're doing these things, then very often it's not a great source for information. You should go back and actually look at the facts. If somebody is saying that the reason for crime is because one group of people is responsible for crime, that is false, that is inflammatory, that's bad for our country. And so you need to really dig in and find the real information to be able to combat that because it's up to all of us, I think, to be voices. It's not just your vote, it is your voice. And to use your voice to say this isn't the kind of country we want. We want to bring people together. Key is research. Is that Absolutely. your... Absolutely. Look into the facts. Find independent sources. Find sources you don't agree with and see what their arguments are comprised of. Look into the facts they use. See if they're credible. Talk to your friends. Talk to people you trust who you know know a lot about the issue. Right. Really approach it as getting as much information as possible. I think one of the dangers we have, especially today with so many different sources of information, is that if it's not on our Twitter feed, if it's not on our Facebook, if it's not on websites that we go to all the time, we tend to disregard it. And I think that we need to make sure that you're at least making an effort to consider, if not accept, the arguments of the other side, which not only has the benefit of making your arguments stronger, but of having as us as a whole, as a country, have a great dialogue about what we want to be doing. So thank you so much for being here and taking the time out of your busy schedule. Thank you for having me. For more information on Storefront Political Media, please visit storefrontpolitical.com. Thank you for joining us today on IDTV.
Digital ID Tribe. I'm your co-host, Jeffrey Murat, and today in studio we have Scott Samuel. Scott, thank you for joining us. Hey, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me. It's come to my attention that you've prepared a song for the audience and I? Yeah, I run an independent label here in San Francisco called Richland Records, and I'm a hip-hop recording artist on that label by the name of S-Class, and I'm here to perform a song about the housing crisis and evictions here in San Francisco. Outstanding. Well, I think the audience and I are ready to hear your song. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you. From HP to the hate, sunset to the mission, from greedy landlords to crooked politicians, from Geneva Avenue to the Golden Gate Bridge, our city's fast becoming a playground for the rich, utterly clueless to the city's history or fabric, ask any local, the situation's tragic, billionaires like Ron Conway all up in the mix, how many square miles in the city, he said there were six, not nah, Ron, there's 49, just ask Santa Clara, this techie takeover marks the end of an era, real people with roots, Steadily getting displaced, at least now I can buy a $10 cupcake. Nothing sweet, no matter how you slice it. If you're not rich, you'll get the short end of the stick. So hit the bricks quick, slick is what they're telling me. Wicked two-tiered system, elite and the peasantry. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. The city burns, technology bubbles. Ushering in new firms nonstop. What happens when the bubble goes pop, double, double toil and trouble the city burns technology bubbles ushering in new firms non-stop what happens when the bubble goes popping in flux the tech bros in luxury condos noses glued to cell phones guarded like pawn shows cold shoulder no courtesy to even say hello a techno hellhole devoid of any soul if you talk to me like i belong to a lower caste i'll smash your demi tass right through your google glass do yourself a favor and show some respect that's when they see your face rest assured they'll swipe left I'm blessed and not just gonna blame the techies Lots of responsibility falls squarely on Ed Lee Who as an attorney after UC Berkeley was for affordable housing Oh the irony but he pays the path paid by Newsom and Slick Willie Repping big business not his constituency Then he dropped the ball like Cam in Super Bowl 50 Now he's cheating on his wife sleeping with Airbnb Bubble bubble toil and trouble The city burns technology bubbles Ushering in new firms nonstop. What happens when the bubble goes pop? Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. The city burns technology bubbles. Ushering in new firms nonstop. What happens when the bubble goes pop? The city's housing being sold to the highest bidder. The digital rush for gold apparently just glitter. Capitalism uncontrolled as developers snicker. Our city's heart and soul is now cold and bitter. If you can't write code for Dropbox or Twitter, your time here is borrowed. You better consider a brand new zip code. No more city slicker. Maybe Kosovo, maybe somewhere nearer. Affordable rents are nothing short of a thing of the past. The middle class in the midst of a disappearing act. On the fast track, if you will, to become an artifact. Need to find a scape route while being under attack. Imperative we break this class line that divides us. If that one day they'll find us in the Academy of Science. As our rich poor gap widens, it makes me wonder how our income inequality is on par with Rwanda. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. The city burns, technology bubbles. Ushering in new firms nonstop. What happens when the bubble goes pop? Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. The city burns, technology bubbles. Ushering in new firms nonstop. What happens when the bubble goes pop? <laughs> 